Hey, what's up? This is Matt Harvey from Exhumed, Gruesome, Pounder, and Scarecrow, and you are experiencing Poppet's Corner. Cheers. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Poppet's Corner. Looking forward to doing these as always. And I'm going up a little bit north, northern for me, I should say. And we're going to uh, go up to the, uh, I guess, I would say what, or uh, Oregon, see, you know, Washington kind of area. And uh, I'm going to talk to uh, the main songwriter, main man of, uh, of Sleepless and, of course, Dead Conspiracy, Mr. Eric Dorsett. Eric, how you doing, man? Thanks again for coming on the show and hanging. I appreciate it uh, and I appreciate a moment of your time. I'm doing killer, man. This is awesome. It's an honor. Appreciate you. So pretty much the, the basis of the show is I'm going to go through your entire musical career and just learn a little bit about yourself and tell some killer stories and whatnot. So if, you're, <laughs> if you're ready, I'd love to get started. I'll do my best. Let's do it. <laughs> so right off the bat, let me ask you this. What can you give me the general your general recollection of just hearing music for the first time? And what was the band that did it for you? Hearing music the first time, <clears throat> sorry, um, I don't know if, I, if it like blows up the speakers might clear my voice, but uh, uh, hearing music the first time, my dad used to play guitar and sing like Joni Mitchell and Grateful Dead stuff when I was a kid. And then my aunts were all into Motown. So like dancing with my mom and my aunts and stuff like that. And then listening to my dad sing hippie stuff. Um, putting on headphones the first time and like listening was um, the Beatles, let it be. Um, but what did it was like so many other guys in my generation. I moved into my parents split up. I moved into this apartment complex and uh, met the kid next door. And he's like, you got to come to my house and listen to records. So went over and he popped on rock bottom from kiss alive. And that was it. That was it. So, mom, I got to go to the store. I got to get a record, bought Kiss Alive, and that's the end of that, you know. And generally, were your parents uh, supportive of your choice of music around this time? Uh, yeah, I mean, they didn't, they didn't care. My, well, my parents were broke, broken up, but they didn't. Um, my mom, I mean, I still joke about it now. We went out to karaoke, and for I know, someone's birthday, my mom was there, and I was doing, I was singing Rocket Ride. And uh, so I was like, hey, this mom and my mom bought me this album. You guys, uh, when I was nine, I was eight, you know, put my hand, put your hand in my pocket, grab one of my rocket. And my mom's like, oh, my God, I'm a horrible parent. <laughs> I'm like, no, you raised me right. You know what I mean? I didn't know what the hell I was singing about. Singing to the girls out the window when you're nine. I mean, you know, it was Ace Freely. He was going to go in a rocket ship, you know. Fucking so, off, man. yeah, but, <laughs> I think they were kind of hands off, <laughs> put it that way. So that's kind of cool. So they had their kind of generation and they were supportive of, of you developing this next generation, which was again, the seventies and, and, and whatnot. And what were some of the other records that you were getting into and, and how are you getting into the other, I guess, heavier styles of music? Was it just by going over to your neighbors and him showing you the record so you would get a copy of it at the store the next day or. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, Heavy's relative, like my mom was into like Mothers of Invention and the Fugs and stuff like that. So I think she considered herself pretty underground herself. <laughs> and so, you know, for, it wasn't shocking, you know, the, so, but, you know, but, you know, my babysitter was listening to uh, Alice Cooper. So I'm like, oh, I need to check out Alice Cooper. And then, you know, it just, I mean, I was, I'm 53. So, you know, you heard, heard like uh, Four and Four when I was like riding big wheels down the hill. I remember hearing the Four and Four album and going, "Oh, I like that," you know. And it's just whatever. But Kiss was it for me. I just had to have every Kiss record, and that's all I really cared about until until I joined the Columbia Records and Tapes Club or whatever, and got like you know Billy Idol and the Police and you know um, what else did I get? Now? Fast Way. I get Fast Way in that like. I mean, you know, yeah, stuff like that. It was just, it just kind of segue. I mean, just kind of naturally. It was, it's a ir weird progression because early before I started playing any music, my buddies and I, have, like a lot of people, you know, were like, "Yeah, we're going to be rock stars." And um, I always loved the story because I, my friend told me like, he's like, uh, "I'm going to get my drum kit, you know, but first we got to get uh, cocaine addictions and uh, <laughs> we got to start drinking a lot." And I was like, "What? Why?" And 
he's like, dude, it's just part of being a rock star. Like you gotta be, you gotta have, you gotta, you gotta have problems. You gotta be able to deal with them. It's just part of the life. It's going to help you write better songs. Meanwhile, he's like, you know, I wish we had someone to help us out. My, uh, my cousin's in a band, but he, there's a shitty band out of California, a shitty punk band, and they're not going to do anything. So they're not going to be any help. And he showed me the record, the welcome to Venice album. <laughs> His cousin was Mike Muir. And, um, so he never reached out to him. <laughs> I was like, he couldn't have been further off. You know what I mean? So that was like how oblivious we were. And we're just little kids, you know, and just listening to whatever, whatever, you know. And what about Kiss always? I always hear the same kind of stories that you do, like the Beatles or Kiss or or just any of these, the traditional style bands that people just get into. But what was it about Kiss around the seventies and I'm going to say early eighties because fast wave was like, the, I think the early eighties. So yeah. and generally mm -hmm. in that time period, what about kiss did it for music fans and especially a, a, a kid such as yourself? I mean, it's the, it's the makeup and the, the gimmick tree. I mean, you know, you got the record and you opened it up and there's, you know, full color full you know, pull outs where you can look at all the pictures of Gene spitting blood and, you know, but I mean, a song like rock bottom, it's just always, I mean, it just had that energy live, you know, just it just made you feel like you want to play music like, uh, you know, you want you want to go, you know, boom, hear that bass, you know, going. you want you want to hear the crowd screaming like that. That just got me excited. I, I don't, uh, you know, all those other bands you know, came around. Just it was just part of the growing up, you know, but Kiss was at the time anyway for me was just so pivotal and and um and i never even really sat down like started learning kiss songs when i started playing i played black diamond in my first band but I, but uh other than that i mean you know and even like you mentioned the beatles like the, my, my earliest memory with listening to with cans on like i got now was the was the beatles but they never really did it for me i liked the rolling stones a lot more my aunt was a heroin addict and played the stones all the time and i liked that uh, a lot more I, I just always liked the more the darker side the heavier side and you know whatever that was at the time you know it's it's interesting and, and and going off of obviously getting all these influences and whatnot did you start to see more kids around getting into the same style of band so you would go to the concerts with them or did your parents drop you off at, at going to the shows because again you're like nine or ten at this point so i don't know how no. many concerts you saw around you know that specific time period. none we we didn't go to shows i mean my parents like said we're split up we were poor and so we didn't i mean we lived in a shack over the top of a you know like on cinder blocks we had an outhouse um so i was lucky that i had kiss records and i mean my my you know i had relatives who would take me out and buy me a record you know um my first concert was the police ghost in the machine tour uh so it was like 81 and then my second show was iron maiden saxon fast way in 83 and i was in eighth eighth grade i guess then and was so. when was the time when you decided not just to listen to music, but to actually want to play music and play an instrument? And what was the instrument that you chose? I chose bass right away because of Gene Simmons. And then when I was 14, I used to go to a local well club here in Portland called Roseland Theater. It used to be called Starry Night back then when I was 14. And I watched all the local bands, which had guys in it like Steve Hanford, who ended up like in Poison Idea, legendary drummer, you know, Dean Castronovo was uh, in the band Wild Dogs. So, you know, I'd, I'd watch their bass player go off and I was like, God, look at that killer strap on this bass, you know, I'm going to be like that, you know, and uh, and I went, you know, and I decided to get my first bass. So I put one on layaway and um, mowed yards to make the weekly payments on it till it was paid off had no case had no strap had no i had a cord i guess and they must have thrown in you know plugged in my friend's stereo we wrote our first song trapped in chains that day and that you know that was that i was like i wanted to play music since you know just sitting in the room air guitaring motley crew you know too fast for love and all that stuff you know iron maiden you know peace of mind and all that and you didn't have kiss. to Right, right. And of course, and, and but you didn't have to do like a requirement for school as far as picking an instrument beforehand or any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. No, you know, it, it was always like everybody wanted to be in the everyone wanted to play drums and you had to be super cool, which I wasn't. So I never got picked for snare. So it was like, well, you can play violin or you can fuck off. 
you know? So um, I picked up an acoustic guitar in fifth grade and it was huge and you're learning green sleeves and I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I dropped that. And then, yeah, the first instrument for me was always going to, I wanted it to be the bass. So once I, once I started that, I also, um, not long after that, well, not too long after that, I started playing guitar as well, um, more out of necessity because I wanted to write music and I felt like it needed to be on guitar. Right. And it's all about the riff. So I, I totally yeah. get it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Did you start to, uh, take lessons at this time? Or are you all self-taught? I was self-taught immediately and a bunch of us in high school like when we were freshmen in high school started learning from some local guitar player and he t basically taught us some cover tunes and you know but i started just playing what i could play you know so i had that band we called ourselves tyrant and um you know we had our tune trapped in chains i don't remember if we had any other originals we had a couple couple covers and then but by this point i mean we're talking you know like 14 years old i guess uh, 14 and 15 and uh, I started playing punk so I got into punk around that same time so it was like I discovered the New York bands like Ag Agnostic Front you know that just did it for me because again it was just pissed off and you know I like music that was pissed off it, it's interesting because it, it's a it's a it's a balance for me you know find I mean like I especially outwardly it was bands like agnostic front that did it for me the the new york bands in particular but at the same time it was bands like i like run dmc i like the i like the like burgeoning very beginning of the hip-hop movement um i like music that was angry and pissed off at the man regardless of what that was you know and i like music like and then merciful fate came along and that was a big deal for me because it was uh blasphemous and that was also pissed off at the man in the best way uh, in the way that I really fell in love with, which was, you know, finding every way I could to fuck with religion. Um, now you, let's go back to this aspect. You said you were playing, I guess, a more punk style. What can you give me just a, I guess your recollection of what was happening around your area at this particular time playing in, in Tyron, I think was, you said it was your first band, but what yeah. were some of the styles that were happening around, uh your specific area <laughs> well we had portland then was really divided between um um punks and metalheads right and you had the wavos so it was the 80s 83 45 and you had a neo-nazi movement in portland western hammer skins east side white pride stuff like that so you kind of um i was on the metal side so like the guys in Wehrmacht went to you know school across town for me and we we're all trying to find our way like how we're going to play in these bands and be at the same parties and stuff, but also not having to fight skinheads every day or whatever. And it's, it was crazy. And then you had the, you know, the Wavos. My girlfriend was a, was a new waver, which I was secretly loved Duran Duran and stuff like that as well, which I still do. Um, you know, I find the best stuff to listen to before I go in the studio is like Seal or Duran Duran, clear my mind of anything metal and then go in there with a fresh perspective. Um, but yeah, that's a kind of feed off that. But yeah, at the time that was what was going on. And, for me, I just, I kind of had blinders, I guess. And when I looked in retrospect, it's like, I just didn't give a shit. I mean, I walked around with a Run DMC shirt on, I had cowboy boots with spurs and a leather jacket and long hair with Bruce Dickinson bangs and a mustachio. And, you know, I, I just did whatever I wanted to do. I was six, four and two or some pounds. If people didn't like what I had to say, I'd throw them across the table and it'd be the end of it. Like it was just, I just did what I wanted to do, you know? And I, and I, I've never really cared. And, um to my detriment sometimes because even at that time um guys like kevin hahn who's in sleepless you know he was an upperclassman and those guys were all learning to play like really play and i was like fuck that i want a gut like shan mortimer from Wehrmacht. he's got killer beer gut man and when he wears this bass underneath it you know his fucking shirt off and he's badass that's what i wanted and they were like oh no phrygian mode you know and i'm <laughs> and i just I was like, fuck you guys. And they're like, Slayer can't even play. They don't play in key. They don't use anything. I was like, listen to them. It sounds badass. Who cares? You know? And uh, I think I was right in the long run because music isn't about modes and scales anyway. And music theory is only a way to write down music that was already written. So whatever you write is what you wrote. And it's all music. Does not matter. 
So they all they're all eating their words now, and they realize the greatness of bands like Slayer. But or they've given up on music. All those guys. Will. Anyway, well, music I can go should, down a rabbit hole. Right. Well, music should always be a feeling. I I think it's a, it's almost an emotion. It's almost like an, a part a part of of you as a player. You know, mm-hmm. so whatever you're writing is a is a part is only a part of of you. Maybe individually speaking too. You know what I mean? Hundred so, percent. Um, can you walk me through your first? your first recollections of playing live in front of people for the first time. And I'm, I'm assuming you were super nervous and, and just walk me through that whole, that first memory of just getting, you know, p- placing your feet on the stage for that first time. Well, other than playing like little parties, like in P- our friends' houses, uh, my first time on stage was at what really is legendary club, uh, Satyricon here in Portland, where like Kurt and Courtney met and that kind of shit. Um, uh, I was then playing a punk band called Protest, and uh, that's the first time I like, wrote some music, uh, and that was my first time on stage. So I was like 16, I think, and Eric DeTablin, who's still my bestie and drummer, um, was playing drums. He was 14 on his little CB700 kit. The other guys in the band were in their 20s. So we had Barry Brusso, who's a great songwriter to this day big ass mohawk and the club owner i remember was like what the fuck are you bringing these guys <laughs> like in the band and eric is filipino so at 14 he looked eight and so he's like do not let them drink that was the biggest thing so where he said okay i got it so we didn't but we played with a band called false liberty and another band called jim jones and the kool-aid kids and um <laughs> fantastic uh punk bands and um false liberty from seattle they're really good and uh, that was that. I mean, that was our first time on stage and got a few pictures of that. I want to release that protest demo at some point. It was, it was pretty cool punk, old school punk. And, um, but yeah, that was, I mean, that was it. You know, once you're on stage, it's, that's the vibe. <laughs> that's what you want, you know? And, and after that, it was like, we're punk. So we you know, were playing a lot of parties and, and that kind of thing. And when was the first moment when you actually went into the recording studio? And I'm assuming this was probably, you probably all did it at the same time. It wasn't like everybody had to play to a click. It was just kind of put, uh, what I don't was, know. What was a click in 87, yeah. you know, 86, um, protest recorded in my mom's basement. So on a Fostex four track or something like that. So I have that demo I actually had lost it forever. I got it off a Russian, like pirating site, um, the torrent site and uh uh dead conspiracy the 87 demo like uh, i guess what some people call legendary whatever like one of those early you know that that was our first time that was my first time recording and um it was raw as fuck and it was a heavier kind of style of music so if we're going if we're doing dead conspiracy already um i mean how did dead conspiracy <laughs> actually actually form well, I mean, yeah, there wasn't much else going on for me in those other times. I mean, it was, I was playing in bands that, that kind of wanted to start doing like Wasp and Rat and stuff like that. And I covers and I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to write original music. And at that point, you know, in the mid 80s, I guess I was getting into like Exodus and and things like that were kind of above my pay grade musically. But so I wanted to find more people that could play. And it just wasn't really working out. And um, I was pretty frustrated. And uh, I mean, it was crazy story but eric my drummer um was again he was like 14 at the time maybe he's 15 by this point 14 i guess he got grounded because he got a d in school so his parents took his drum set away so we quit protest together um meanwhile the couple of the guys who founded dead conspiracy as a punk band uh the original logo had an iron cross in the middle instead of you know like the pentagram and stuff like that and um mark and chris had started as a punk band and they ended up playing in that band protest and changed his name to crud or something like that. Dread, dread. And, um, and they ended up quitting cause they decided they wanted to play metal, which I guess was going to end up we were calling it death metal. One, we want to play metal. And I got a call from Mark Murphy, the singer one day, and he just said, Hey, Jamie and Barry from protest said, that there's these two rivet heads, as they called you guys, that were um, long hairs and wanted to play metal and you guys interested. And they said, we're called Dead Conspiracy. And I was like, oh, shit, I saw your flyer in the music shop looking for a guitarist. And I'm like, 
not good enough on guitar to audition. So, but I loved what I saw. I'm like, fuck yeah, let me, let me call Eric, you know? And, and I called him, you get your drums back yet? And he did. So, um, <laughs> we, we met up at my mom's house. Mark Murphy showed up with braces and like purple bubble gum stuck in his braces. And, um, they, I, <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. And, um, we went downstairs and Chris Carey showed us the riffs to the immortal strife, our first song. And Eric started playing the drums. I mean, dude, we walk, we learned so much together. I mean, Eric and I remember we sitting down, like figuring out like double time or like skank beats or whatever before they, whatever they called. It was just like, you know, okay, I think it's two on the hi hat and then the snare and then, you know, do that, do that, do that, do, you know. And he had to figure all, we had to literally figure what this shit was. You know, there was, we had no clue. There was nobody else doing anything like that around us. So, um, that day though, I mean, wrote that song and I just, I, I'll never forget it. And I'll never forget Chris being across from me on his little cheap, like boards, knockoff guitar. And that I, I don't remember what it was. He'll probably get pissed at me. It was probably something better than that. It was not, it was, and, um, and Mark starts singing and you know, that, wow, and I did that little guy, man, did this horrifying lows and these creepy killer highs and I just goosebumps. I was like, fuck, this is my life. This is it. You know? And, um, we went a little, we, I mean, we wrote the five song demo and not long. Uh, and I wrote two of the songs, I think on that grotesque disjunction and dormancy, um, out of the five songs on there. And then uh, the rest was Chris and our guitarist at the time, Jason Nikus. Um, and, we went in a little studio called Chicken Coop. I think some of the guys, I don't think Vermont ever recorded there, but some of the guys they were associated with, they're like side bands did. It was a guy in the guy's basement. It was like an eight track. It was eight track. Um, and, so, and I'm, yeah, go ahead. Right. I was going to ask though, immediately after the demo gets recorded, how do you mm -hmm. start to, uh, to, to give that tape out? Are you doing the tape trading around this particular time? Are you, are you discovering obviously bands from all around the world due to this, this whole process? Yeah. Well, because of the punk scene, we were into like maximum rock and roll magazine, you know, so maximum rock and roll, same thing. You had all those addresses in the back to write to people. And we just started getting, you know, mailing lists from people and, I uh, started getting to the fanzines and by 88, I had my own fanzine called Necromantic Press, uh, which is the name of my own personal label now. And we did just a couple issues, but it was pretty cool. I mean, we interviewed lots of great people and met lots of great people, traded tapes. And it's a trip. I mean, it was just, it was a very interesting period of time. You know, I, it's, you're writing to people in the back of magazines and, you know, one day, like I remember like a tape showed up from Trey Azikoth and, you know, and Mark was at his mom's house and he pulls it out and he's, I see that, that cover, you know, for the what, Altars of Madness what was that, it was called Thy Kingdom Come, right? The, what was the EP, the, the, the cassette? Uh, abom uh, not, not Abomination. That, that's the album. Yeah. I think it's Thy Kingdom Come. I think uh -huh. that's what it is. And we put that in the tape deck and I sure enough, and I went, fuck, we need to start practicing. Like it was, I was like, ah, we're in trouble. You know, like it was just, it was crazy, man. You just like, none of these bands, we didn't, nobody heard, heard each other. We're just sending tapes back and forth. The bands like Sepultura got like lots of shit because people say they weren't getting their tape from their ripoff artists. You know, you go, I've been to Brazil because of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I've been there many times. I, those tape, that money never made it to the band, I'm sure. Like, you know, that money got taken to the post office and, you know, they would say, oh, we never got paid for the tapes and that's why we never shipped them out. And it was a whole thing like in the, you know, the, the underground is very interesting how that worked. But you met so many cool bands, great bands like Necrovore. I remember it was always one of my favorites and and uh, that were became inspirational. It's, it's weird because you you look now and you I, I read reviews of the bands. And I feel really old because, I you know, it's like, oh, dead conspiracy. Yeah. You can see how they're really influenced by bands like Sarcophago. And I'm like, fuck, I did not hear them until I pulled them up on YouTube, like not long ago. Like, I, we had, we, how were we supposed to hear those bands? You know, we heard the same stuff, you know, we heard, I, I don't know, Possessed, you know, I saw Slayer and Possessed in 85 and Possessed to me was like the shit. So sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and, it's sarcophago. I mean, you know, the obviously the first record comes out in eighty seven too. So it's kind of yeah. highly I don't know. I, I wouldn't 
I, I wouldn't say you were influenced by by them just because <laughs> they came out the same year at a time when you didn't have the internet. So you, everything wasn't instantaneous as, as the, it is now. The devil inspired us both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so obviously you record the first demo, it circulates. What kind of a buzz does it start to get in 87? Not nowadays, but I'm talking in yeah. when it initially gets released. It was a really great time to start a metal band in Portland in the eighties. There has never been another place in time where, you know how it is now bands playing for bands, six bands on the bill, everybody with their girlfriend or boyfriend in the audience, you know, and five of them go up on stage and the other 50 watch. Um, back then, if there was a flyer, if there was a concert flyer, you went to the show. If you looked at like the logo, you know how I'm talking about, you walked into a record store, I'd walk into second Avenue records and Todd behind the counter is playing the first Bathory record. And you're like, you know, what the fuck is that? It's rare. And he goes, God, it's scary, man. It's look at this fucking goat. And I was like, that's too much for me. And I bought the artillery album and like uh, uh, MC Hammer's first EP when he had like just black outfit and a gold chain. It was shitty, but but that's what I got because it was the new stuff and I couldn't handle whatever bathroom was doing at the moment. And then I caught on. Um, but but yeah, so we sold demos at like Second Avenue Records was the spot in Portland. So we would I'm I never forget I was sitting out in front of Second Avenue. I was 17 River with my big gulp and Todd from Second Avenue came out. He's like, Hey, are you in Dead Conspiracy? I'm like, Yeah. He goes, Do we sold out of your demo? Like 50 copies, cassettes in 87. We sold out. Can you bring us more? I'm like, you know, like, oh yeah. <laughs> and, uh, guys, guys, you know, you couldn't call them on your cell phone. So it'd be like, I can't wait till band practice so I can tell everybody we sold out of cassettes and we got to go place an order to get more cassettes made. And, you know, it was like sold out, sold out, sold out, sold out, you know, um, and we just printed them, uh, fold them up and put them together and sell them. And, and but you would our first show was uh, we put on and it was at a place called the 99 Musicians Union Hall. Um, we brought the guys in Sadus up from Antioch because um, we had interviewed them for our fanzine and we were big fans of the death to posers demo. Uh, and they came up and they were a fucking trip. That's a whole, if you got another 30 minutes, that's it. <laughs> that was, those guys are a trip, man. They were <laughs> but, but they were cool. It was, it was cool. And it was a good show. Um, and it was packed, you know, like, I don't know what, 150 people or something like that for this little teeny place. And our next show, I think was a headlining show at the starry night. Where I used to, where I saw Metallica, like there was like 550 people there. We had the, you know, the the the, the owner go, came over and was like, "Fuck, we need to set up security. Like, there's a line around the corner." <laughs> and we're like, "What?" You know, and we just asked, "Hey, can we headline?" Yeah, sure, go ahead. You know, it was so it was just such a weird place in time, and and the fact that people would just come out. Like, I went to every show I saw a cool flyer for. You know, everything. And it was based and, off a demo. It wasn't like it was a full-length record. This is just a, yeah. a demo we're talking about. You know? It was a demo and word of mouth. Like, you know, you went to the same parties and, you know, people were like, you know, people wanted to go. You know, people wanted to go. They were hungry for this type of music. I mean, there was there was no death metal bands in town. So there was, it was us and uh, my girlfriend at the time in, uh, met me, introduced, she lived out in the middle of the country and she introduced me to these guys in the band called Savior. Um, who went on to like uh, Jeff from that's guitarist for Poison Idea, and he's a he's a big punk guy, Beer Zone and Chart Busters, and he's a, he's an amazing guitarist. Uh, but anyway, I went out to their house and watched them play, and they were doing like Slayer and Creator covers, and they played proficiently, like they're amazing, and their originals were awesome too. So they played with us on that first show, and then they just started taking off too. It's like if you did if you did that music in any way, shape, or form, you just you know people wanted to go. And, and uh, so it was pretty much the same lineup of bands on so many shows with like one added in, like Poison Idea would headline one or Gargoyle would headline or something like that. Or I think Gargoyle ended up opening for us. But, um, you know, and then we got on whatever shows we wanted. I mean, it, did, it didn't matter like Dead Conspiracy, like, you know, Dark Angel came. It was like, we're going to we're gonna open for Dark Angel, no problem. You know, the uh, combat records tour you know death dropped off right before which was a bummer i remember gene talking about the argument about their drum riser who got to use it and all that kind of thing so they dropped off we were really pissed we ended up playing with death later that was death carcass pestilence dead conspiracy and some other band 
you know, not a okay. shitty show. So that was like, <laughs> that must've been like 89, 89 mm -hmm. or, or 90, somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, but why not just try, or I'm not even going to ask you cause it's, I for, keep forgetting it's not the internet age, but mm -hmm. you know, you could, you didn't make a full length during this whole time period. So my, my question then becomes, did you guys start to, uh, you know, send out your tapes to labels at all, or is it just strictly just send them to everybody? Okay. They hated it. I mean, all they hated it. They just said it's too like metal blade. All those labels were just like, yeah, it's too intense. It's not what we're signing right now. And then as our music started to change and we started to bring in other influences and we weren't death metal anymore, they were signing death metal bands. So, um, what we were doing at the time was very different. We really should have just made a side band and just kept Dead Conspiracy doing what we were doing and, and made another band to do kind of bringing our eclectic feel. But that, I mean, we got courted by Atlantic. Um, and, uh, but they wanted us to tour with the horn section. And we were like, we don't, we just used them on a couple of songs. You know what I mean? Like it was, they wanted a shtick. Was, that was the later period. Yeah. And so they, that, none of that ever got released. Met, New Renaissance Records had, a full album that we wrote called Ring the Bells of Revolution and it'll never come out. So Oh interesting. Yeah, they, so you actually you actually did or went to the uh a recording studio to record a full length record and the and it was mm -hmm. essentially shelved. It got the label burned down. So Anne Boleyn's apartment or whatever from New Renaissance burned down. And so like artwork was gone, the album was gone. I've got like dat tapes and I've had people ask about releasing it, but we're not really interested. I mean, if we did, we'd call it the dead cons or something like that. I wouldn't call it dead conspiracy. And just because it's not the same band, it wasn't the same band at all. It was, we were just trying to do something else. Um, it was just kind of a frustrating, it, it became a frustrating time. It was very, it was very, a very liberated time, um, which was cool. You know, bands like Guns N' Roses came out and influenced everybody. And some people started moving towards that kind of thing. But we also wanted to play heavy, but we also wanted to do this and that. And then the guitarist got into surf a little bit. And, you know, it was like, you just kind of went, you know, you know and it was just a very natural fuck fest. <laughs> and, and you guys were were kind of prolific re releasing demo after demo after demo because you know you had yeah. like four or five of them in the course mm -hmm. of what two or three years like two so, years yeah were you um again i'm assuming this is you know kind of like a you all are all are in the same kind of studio together or in a garage whatever it is four mm -hmm. tracks on and, and go it's it's not like it's on uh, no we recorded the first demo at, at chicken coop um and we actually recorded the second demo at chicken coop productions a eight track um at a, he had a new location todd i think his name was um we recorded his new location for that one and then after that we started going to sound impressions which is where bands like poison idea were recording and and a lot of pop bands and stuff like that so it was a 24 track and we're, so we did some stuff there and I mean, we did a song called Vanish into Enslavement, which I still fucking love and we've never redone. I'd, I'd like to redo that with the guys. Um, it's a very cool song, a very, a little more technical, thrashy, but also death metal. Um, and that was just the worst recording you could ever imagine. It was on the 24 track. And I don't mean rustic. I don't mean like when people now say, how did you get that amazing sound in the 87 <laughs> demo? I'm like, that was luck. Cause we just, we got lucky. It sounds cool in retrospect. This was horrible, like warbly and just it's unlistenable. It's on the actually on the Gore Drench Legacy record that that uh, Hell's Headbangers put out, but it, fuck it, it's horrible. It needs to be redone. Um, but that's what we did, and so I mean, we did. There, there isn't as many demos as people think there is. So when you read like, there's like discographies out there of these demos that we never did. Some of them, like there was one they called Vomit Gore, which was cool, but. That's what we, Mark and I called our production company for putting on shows was Vomit Gore Productions, but there was never a demo called Vomit Gore or a song or anything. Although we are talking about doing another release and just putting it on cassette and actually calling it Vomit Gore. And it'll be the Vomit Gore demo that never came out. That's fucking awesome. Unrele <laughs> yeah. Unrelease and that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so what were you doing? Let me, let me ask you this. So in like 89, 90, when does dead conspiracy all, like essentially kind of call it quits around this time we we it was um when we changed styles we were just cha we were changing so quickly it was like the, there was that death metal phase and then period which was the band and then we started bringing in other like eclectic ideas and things to the music and 
um we got really into like the socio-political scene you know we were we were like featured on you know the feminist radio shows and stuff for our lyrics um about misogyny and like we were just getting we were getting pretty um pretty politically active i guess in a way even though we weren't really political people like we just kind of i don't know we were just trying to do the right thing i guess you know um and and the music just started changing um but it got us notoriety in some ways like you know we played at this huge event called the mayor's ball which is at the memorial coliseum and and we put out flyers that said what happens when sly stone meets slayer and it had pictures of slayer and sly stone doing the karate kick or whatever and the fucking place was packed and atlantic records was there and that's when they started talking to us but again like i was on the phone at portland state university talking to them and they're like we're playing the song years and we love what we're hearing you know you got horns on here we want you to come to la and bring your horn section i'm like we don't have one and i and i got all like the clash you know did stuff like that but they didn't you know they didn't have a horn section they just used horns on a couple songs or you know the fucking stones like well we weren't either of those bands we were a bunch of you know 19 year old dipshits and um if we wanted to cash in that would have been the way to do it but we were just like this isn't us we're just doing what we do and then it just imploded from there it was just like we needed to change and our singer came out uh gay and um, and it was um and i think for him he just wanted to separate himself in a lot of ways you know from from where he had been which was kind of um you know I'm going to grow my hair out over my face and no one will ever fucking see me, you know? And I was always like, what is that about? You know, um, not that it even meant anything, but looking back, that's I always tell him I, I figured, you know, what's going on. But, uh, but he got in like Elvis Costello and things like that. He's wanted to do something different, you know, I want to fucking smoke cigars and wear a zoot suit. And, um, you know, and, and I, and I was listening to like parliament funkadelic and, you know, stuff like that. I'm like, this, just was it just fizzled you know just like a bad relationship it just went from pure love to to fizzle it had in in retrospect I'm, i always think like if chris like our, our main guitars if chris at any time had said like um like guys you know what well, let's hold this together let's take our love for death metal for what we were doing and let's just keep doing that, but let's also do experiment and have the freedom and flexibility to do whatever we want. But back then, like to us, a band practiced six days a week. We practiced at a place called the Palace where all the local bands practice and we practiced every day. I went to Portland State University after class. We walked down 12th Street to the Palace and we fucking practiced every day. And that's why we just came out with so much music so quick. And But we also met lots of people going to school, you know, like, percussionists and all these different type of instruments oh he's a cool guy man let's bring him in on a song you know and it, and it just was a natural change up to where it was just wasn't the same anymore but i wished we would have just kept doing that and then did something else but it just wasn't really done back then you know what uh, did you do in the in the the 90s musically speaking not a lot i did like uh bass overdubs for hip-hop bands um i played in uh like a r&b type cover band um i wrote metal on my own but i couldn't find anybody to play with because i mean I, i'm trying to figure out what the years were I, I lose track of the years but like i'd meet people and then they're like yeah this fucking band called corn just came out and this stuff is the best thing ever and i was like it's pretty cool it's kind of game changing but i have no interest in playing it you know, and then they, you know, then the next guys would be whatever was cool at the moment. Oh, you listen to these guys. It's, I'm like, I'm not interested. And in my heart of hearts, what I really wanted was Dead Conspiracy back. I just wanted that back, you know, so, and there was good. Well, why did it take you so long to, to get it back together? Um, I think, well, I mean, I'm not trying to speak for him, but Chris to me has always been the linchpin for the band our guitarist Chris and um and he's the one that's held the style together held the music that's why I say if he would have mentioned something earlier but there, he's had he's had addiction issues and so I'm um, he would I mean sure be, be the first to tell you that that's the case I mean so we fought all the time that kind of thing but just it was a matter of um we just didn't talk for a long time and um I mean I'd hear from people like um you know, have you seen Chris recently? I'm like, no, like we well, should probably reach out to try to find him because he probably won't be alive long. And this was guys in the punk scene you know, like you're not going to be around long. 
and he got sober. He'd been playing, he'd been sober for, I don't know, five years or something like that. And he showed up. I was, uh, at this point, I actually, I, um, let's see, I switched to guitar and I formed a band called Death Saw. Um, I didn't make the name, but, uh, but it was a thrash band and uh, kind of death thrash, blackened death thrash, where we called it at the time. And, uh, that was with Brian Chaney, who sang on the, the, the first day conspiracy album yeah, back. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, and some other really good musicians. We went through like every local Portland punk hero, you know, uh, Brian Hopper, uh, Matt Brainerd, like, uh, Dirty Dan Crenshaw, like all these great guitar punk guitar players played with us to do like kind of their crossover thing. It was fun. And Chris showed up at a, at a show at Satyricon and was watching from the audience the whole time. And afterwards he's like, dude, your guitar playing sounds great. And I was like, great, Chris, you know, hugs, great to see you. And then he called me like, I don't know, months later and was like, Hey, I think it's time to, to do something. Let's get together and have coffee. You know, he's been, I've been sober for five years or whatever. And, and I just, and it was, it was, it was magical. Like once, as soon as we started playing together again, that creative process was just like, wow, you know, right away, new songs coming out, you know, and it just felt like we had never stopped in 87, you know, and were you, were you playing bass? Uh, getting back together with him or did you switch over to guitar or did played, you... he, he wanted me to switch to guitar and i didn't because i was like well let's, let's try to keep it as close as we could to the original thing i'll play bass i think he, that pissed him off actually and <laughs> and he didn't really say anything because he's that kind of guy he'll just not say anything and then later he'll blow up at you and one day he's like this is why i'm fucking pissed off because we get you know every time we get a new guitar player i have to teach him all the fucking songs you know, and if you play guitar, we wouldn't have to worry about that. We just teach some bass player the Disney version and, you know, we'd be fine. And, you know, and so I'm like, well, you should have said something, you know, but uh, and so now if we were going to do something, I would play guitar. So because I, I play guitar pretty much only now unless I'm recording. And um, but uh, yeah, I lost where we were at. Well, why? Okay. Okay. So let's go to like 2012, 2013, you guys reconnect, start jamming. Did, do you get all the members that were previously, you know, did you pick up where you left off, I guess, with all the original members or did you kind of know other people that came into the fold? Was it just you and Chris at this time? It was just me and Chris. Um, and, and, and I wanted Brian Chaney on vocals because Mark, wasn't he changed his name to Frankie and lived in West Hollywood and was doing rock and roll stuff. And he was fucking amazing. The guy I'm producing an album for him right now that I'm playing on and, and co-writing some stuff with him. But he, the guy wrote and put out 365 songs in 365 days with videos on YouTube. He's prolific um, rock writer. And but he says he can't sing death metal anymore. He's he, he, although spoiler alert where he's now claiming he can and wants to do something with dead conspiracy so that could fucking happen and the drummer for dead conspiracy eric my my guy forever he had got married and moved to texas and he lived in austin for like 15 years so we didn't play together so he he wasn't available um we did have uh jeff taylor who would play in a portland band called demise in the 80s and then he played in dead conspiracy around like 89 90 a uh, great guitar player. He's in a band called Death Charge, um, which is more like kind of gothic-y, punky stuff. But um, anyway, he played with us. So we, it, we got Brian on vocals. We got Jeff Taylor on guitar. We had a couple other guys filling in here and there. We had a dude named Skinny that played drums, really talented guy. Um, and so that was that was the lineup, basically. You know, there, was, there was some kind of ins and outs. And, you know. So, and then you guys immediately make an EP with this said lineup and whatnot. I'm just kind of curious, why not do a, a proper full length immediately? And, and were you just trying to start small and then see if you guys can do a full length or. I think we we're just excited to be doing something. And we were like, let's fucking put something out. You know what I mean? And um, we did, we we loved the songs we were doing. We just wanted somebody to hear it. We want people to hear it, you know? So we did the, we came up with the idea to do, to take the original recording from the demo and remaster it and put it on side B and put it on vinyl through my label, which was pretty exciting. And I think it sounds amazing. Um, and those songs sounded great. So that, that was it. And we just would have taken more time. And, and honestly, the, the, the full length album took a long time to put together. 
and it ended up being two different drummers. There was a big falling out with Skinny, um, and he was playing in Dead Conspiracy and, and Poison Idea at the time, and he got kicked out of both bands on the same day. Um, I still love that guy. He's a sweet guy. Was, I don't know. There's some there's some things going on with getting along with people. So I mean, whatever. He he uh, he was out, and so we brought in uh, um, a guy named Eric Alaconis, who's a ba- or the drummer for uh, Defiance. Uh, very prolific punk band, the Portland punk band defines not the oh, Bay Area gotcha, Thrashers. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he 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 did an amazing job. So it's kind of seamless on the album. You can't really tell it's two drummers, and we mixed up the order, so you, you can't tell like there's two totally separate styles basically going on. He's way more punk. You hear a lot more to bat to bat to bat to bat to bat, you know, and kind of those backwards hubcappy sounding riffs uh well how did you do it with a like, tonality wise too man you know like did you record at the same studio and and just bring him in on the same kit not change kevin the hahn dude <laughs> kevin hahn uh, kevin hahn man he is the uh, hans he's the man he, he <laughs> i mean like i said in, in high school kevin was one of those guys that uh was listening to like you know he was doing his bands were doing like michael shanker and Dawkin and striper and you know whatever and uh you know i was playing in punk bands and but we were all friends we, we all had lunch together every day and talked about whether or not the pentatonic scale was worth shit and um you know and it just interesting and you know, we just we just had we all really liked each other kevin and i had going to college together he opened opal studios and he has has been a master of the craft like spent all his time you know just studying songwriting studying styles of music and um and producing and recording so many different artists i mean amy mann who's a award-winning blues bass player and singer and you would know it but she was actually the original bassist for dead conspiracy when they were a punk band and now you look her up amy mann she's like and she's actually i should know she's a singer for a band called white crone she has her own band called white crones like a um me type metal band and she's singing for some other band too i forget i should know what they're called but she's a fantastic singer um but anyway she recorded there uh kevin did the drum tracks for one of the scorpions albums he just produced did recorded the whole new paul gilbert album werewolves of portland um that he's done like uh oh shit. so he's very prolific and in, in prolific his- and different styles black metal he did poison idea he did dead conspiracy so point being like he knows exactly what he needs to do to get the sound for each particular band and not have to put his stamp on it you you can get the tonality then by making sure that like okay well this is how we did this and it's in the computer so you can see what effects you used and things to get that sound and um yeah because and and it's probably simpler with dead conspiracy in a sense because we record everything live there's no click tracks so you know what is the initial reaction when uh, when Abomination Underground comes out at first? Because, you know, it's like, oh, Dead Conspiracy is back. Are you guys playing a lot of festivals or touring around this time? Okay. We thought we would. We did not get asked for to do festivals. We did not get asked to do, like, Milwaukee Metal Fest. We thought we would. Um, I mean, a lot of people really cared. And other people are kind of like, fuck those old guys, I guess. I mean, I think I think we missed that moment. It was like, four or five years earlier when like Fairmont got back together um, that those bands were, and plus we never had a full length out. I think that really hurt us. If, if we would have had a full length to ride on, we're a demo band. So, you know, our like accolades are like people we would talk to, you know, playing with carcass and, you know, them like, Oh, you guys are legendary, you know, where we are from and, and hanging out with Chuck Schuldner, you know, fucking guys came backstage. We're like, we got, limousines with strippers and blow or whatever and he's like no guys i'm hanging out with the guys at dead conspiracy and he's like hey your 89 demo is like one of my top 10 like mike Patton came to town one time and the production company called us because someone from dead conspiracy come down and hang out with mike Patton. like he's like huge fan of the stuff we were doing and 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 it's so cool to hear that stuff but we thought so that's really gonna matter now but it just didn't it just didn't matter i mean there was plenty of great reviews but everything's always comparing it's always comparing to what you did before. And there's no way, there's just no way to escape that, you know, and for around, anybody. And around this time period, cause we have to imagine this too. This is like 2013, 2014 too. The scene was totally different. It wasn't mm-hmm. like, cause, because nowadays I would say that death metal is almost 
more popular now than it was, especially in 2013, mm. 2014, because you, had, you were coming out of the thrash scene out in, in California, at least. And, yeah. and, and that was very prolific. So the next thing and like is the Razorback the, record stuff. and Correct. Yeah. So I think because you guys came out at a time too, that was before all this transpired might've had an effect on, on why it didn't translate or didn't, tr you know, translate kind of over what you wanted it to do for you. But yeah, um, so what is kind of the next step for you in terms of dead conspiracy at this point? So the record gets released. Um, you, obviously you said that, uh, you probably played, a, uh, what, a couple shows at this point. Do you immediately played a lot of shows? Yeah, we played a lot of shows. Yeah. We came, when we came back, we played a lot of shows we around the Northwest primarily. Um, and, uh, they all went, you know, reception was great. I mean, our, our shows are, I, I love dead conspiracy because I feel like, uh, the music just, for death metal, it has this rock and roll uh, arrangement. You know, like I would, I always loved at the end of every show, there would always be one person that would come up and say something like, guys remind me of like an Aussie record, but death metal, you know, like you can sing along, you, you know, the, you know, the chorus from the rest of the song. You I'm like, yes, yeah, because we write riff, you know, first chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, guitar, solo, verse, chorus, done, you know, and it's just a rock and roll arrangement. And we try to stick to that. Um, just kind of do, just pound it in and, and, and just give the best live show we can. So we, we had a fucking blast. There was, the lineup was fun. All the lineups were great. I had just had a blast. And so I want to do more. Well, when was the point when Brian steps down from vocal duties and, and Mike Abominator essentially comes in to, to fill the void at this point? So, I mean, history is open to interpretation. So Chris got a call from Jerry A from Poison Idea, who was one of the nicest people you could ever meet. And and Jerry was bringing Poison Idea back together. And um, Ryan said, I'm going to leave the band. I mean, that quick. I went, what? He's like, e it, we're done. And I, I'm like, what, what do you mean? He's, he said, well, you know, Chris is going to relapse, dude. There's no way he's going to tour Europe with Poison Idea and stay sober. There's no fucking way. And he goes, and everything's going to come crashing down. I'm just going to step aside before. And I was like, come on, man. Like, you know, and that's what happened. So we held it together for a while. Um, I don't want to say too much about the personal stuff with that, but I mean, basically that, that is, that's why Brian left. That's what he told me why he left and i don't remember ever having a other than small altercations like no no problems with, with brian you know and and he's the best i to this day i think he's the best metal singer in the northwest as far as like death metal thrash metal black metal um his ba new band pest 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 and brarum there is fucking awesome black metal um uh but so that that's when we i thought you know I'm going to go fucking big or go home. I'm calling Mike Abominator because I was a, I mean, you know, and, and it got, you know, guys were like fucking big city move, man. I'm like, yeah, I'm not fucking around because I was a fan of Grave Hill and Mike is just a great showman. And, you know, and he just, he's just the best and just such a great guy. And he said, Oh my God. Yeah. I fucking, I can't wait. You know, like I'm going to do this, you know? And, uh, he's like, I'm already writing songs. I'm already writing lyrics. I'm already, getting, you know, and he didn't, he did not mess around. I think we had the whole album recorded and no singer. And he, he came in and, you know, he did, I, I want to say it was like less than six months, four months, three months. And before he came in and started, he went and started doing vocals and, but he did them all remotely and then sent them to us. Okay. Um, now we did you know Mike Abominator, Abominator from Ruin or did you know him from Grave Hill? And then discover all he wasn't doing project. Ruin yet. You know, it wasn't doing Ruin yet. Well, I he, mean, he was in the nineties. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the nineties, yeah, yeah. At the time they weren't back he was just doing Grave Hill. And he had just he had just left Grave Hill, whatever happened there. Um Sure, because so, they wanted to bring back ruin at that point, yes, or gasp or whatnot. It, so, it was, yeah. yes, that's what was happening. Um yeah. So, I mean, he was, I think he was somewhat available, but he, I know he, you know, he's doing lots of other stuff too, but, but, um, I don't know. I just was like, I'm going to throw it out there and see what, see what sticks, you know, before I ask anybody else, you know, um, we had a guy named, uh, Mark, Mark, uh, Marco, um, Marco destructor, 
who is in uh, um, the band Raptor, a uh, thrash band from Portland. He's got a very kind of Mille Petroza type style. Um, and he sang on one song that was on the album that Mike, Mike sang it, but he wrote the lyrics. Um, I think it was called Cruelty Through Ripping Torture. And so um, Marco actually wrote that, but he has got like three kids and he was really busy. So he, he's a really nervous about the studio. Um, it took him a long time to get the tracking done for the one song. And, you know, Mike is like, I think he had like nine vocal takes that he sent us. There's like all these different layers from in the toilet to up high here. And, and we literally went through and, and we edited and just said, we want a low part here. We want a high part here. We want two, three parts here. And we just, we actually constructed the vocal part from all the million takes he sent us. Interesting. So I'm assuming once that specific point happened, he probably comes back and has to relearn everything with you guys to. He was like, holy play. shit. I didn't expect that. You know, I think he just thought we just do different levels or something. We were like, no, we've, we've there was just so much going on. I'm like it's going to be, it's going to be the mic show. Like there was nothing else happening. Um, and, but I mean, he just did such a great job and, and, uh, yeah, so he had to learn the stuff, but I mean, we only got to do one show, you know, we did, we did a festival date and, um, you know, I think we were, we headlined headlined the second stage or whatever. And we did one show with him and, um, with Eric Alaconis on drums and it's a huge shame. Like, it's, you know, it was a huge shame. It was a very sad, sad point for me. Well, in terms of of musically wise, uh, this album to me is super heavy in terms of of your specific career and whatnot. I mean, this was the point, obviously, that I discovered Dead Conspiracy. Oh, cool! Because, uh, because obviously, I'm friends with Mike and whatnot. I yeah. wanted to see what he was doing, and I'm like, oh shit! And then he <laughs> tells me that Dead Conspiracy are big fans of, of Madras, and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, this is such a small yep. world here, uh-huh. and. uh I just love the record so much, but the, the cover itself is only like, it's, it's very simplistic. And I'm mm-hmm. just curious your concept for the, the album cover this time around compared to abomination underground. Um, we wanted to do something simple and we, and Eric Alaconis, our drummer and I, and Eric is a good art, really good artist and graphic artist. We were like, Hey, uh, what the idea was the first armor saint EP that black EP with the bread helmet on it. It was like, it was like that. And there was something else that came out. It was, there was something, it was just something that struck us as like, you know, let's just make it, let's just yeah, make it simple. Or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're just, we're just going to call it dead conspiracy, you know? So I don't know that some things got messed up with that record. The, the promotion thing through CD baby got messed up. So it didn't actually get like a formal release that didn't hit digital when it was supposed to. Um, they didn't get copies at the right time. It was, there was all kinds of shit happened with that record. And so, you know, it, it's interesting because I don't have good distribution myself for my, my indie label. And so I really needed that to, to help catapult it. So yeah, I've got lots of copies of that record that, you know, I get emails pretty regularly from around the world. People saying, I wish I could get a copy of the vinyl. And I'm like, you can, it's cost a fortune to ship it but you know i wish i could get a distribution company to take a few um over there it'd be cool but yeah i mean that album yeah i I love that album a lot i I do too and i'm i'm kind of i shouldn't say the word shock but i'm kind of like a bit taken back that that we're even having this conversation when it comes to like not getting distro for day conspiracy because of i know believe me you guys have Mm -hmm. you know believe me if you know (laughs) some send them my way you know We'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, exactly. um, so let me let me go off at this point too. When does Sleepless actually start? Because this is obviously the first time I'm I'm hearing about it, and didn't even know you were in another project outside of of Dead Conspiracy. So more than did, you know, bro. Yeah. Well, exactly. Right. But I got more. I got more. We'll, we'll be talking quite a bit. Uh, on this <laughs> so when with Sleepless, when does the, this project actually begin? <clears throat> so okay. Last chapter in Dead Conspiracy, not the final, but the most recent, Eric the Tablin moved back to Portland, our drummer. And so we started, I called Chris and I said, we're going to do, dude, we're going to, we're going to get this shit together and we're going to move Eric Alaconis from drums to bass. And I'm switching the guitar to Tablin on drums. This will be the closest to the original lineup as we've ever had. So, and uh, so Eric though had been playing by himself for 15 years. And 
he he had kind of he had lost his ability to really play with a band very well like because he just played by himself and so he's practicing five million beats a second double bass parts you know and it was sounded cool but it didn't sound cool with the band like you know where was the groove and it took us a while but we worked really hard and he worked very hard and we finally had our first rehearsal with chris at the end of like three months and he showed up and it didn't go well and it didn't go well and there was <laughs> arguing and it was it wasn't great and even eric eric's the most mild mannered guy you'd ever imagine he actually got pissed like stood up from his kit and was like dude we're been working really hard and you know like you kind of come in with an attitude and it just wasn't great i said oh practice is over for today and i called mike up and said and he had to cancel plane tickets for uh, a short tour we were going to do and he had helped organize so that would have been a huge help for that album too uh and we we had to basically just shit can the whole thing and and it was just one of these moments like <sighs> here we go like disappointed you know again and so that was the end of that for now. We're all in contact now. Chris and I are supposed to have coffee here soon. Um, our original singer is talking about doing some stuff. And hey, maybe it'll be shared. Maybe it'll be him and Mike Abominator. Maybe it'll be him, Mike Abominator, and Brian Chaney. And we'll, I mean, we'll do something like this. You know, I mean, who knows? With, with The sky's the limit, I guess. You know, I, I kind of want to do this vomit gore thing. You know, I want to do a cassette and just like kind of go out like we came in. Do like one more thing. You know, and, and um, so I've started writing some stuff for that already. So, um, and Chris and I are talking about co-writing right now. So that, that could, that could be good stuff going on, but they're sleepless. And that is, I just watched that documentary on Andy Warhol and I can't remember who he's quoting, but he was talking about how he, at one point he decided he should probably go back. He should have gone back and did his um, soup can art he did when he started again, because artists only make one painting ever in their life and their career. And I was like, well, what the fuck's my painting? You know? And I started thinking about like the way I write, like the, the te technique. I, I mean, the style I have when I write and um, Chris was always a master at keeping me within the rails because of what happened with dead conspiracy in the eighties. When I would write something that did not fit the feel of dead conspiracy, he would say, no, too much and i go i go gotcha cool no problem how about this one you know yeah that's great you know so it was cool and he, i really i love that he did that um but there was a lot more to what i had cooking there was a lot more good or bad didn't matter there was my art whatever my expression musically is some is 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 more than that or different than that and um there was not to be long winded, but so like basically it, it, there was like a period of like pretty deep depression, anxiety, like horrible. I had a, I owned a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy for 10 years and I had a really unhealthy relationship with my business partner and then dead conspiracy fell apart. And um, my daughter was uh, living on the street and like, you know, it was just, there was a lot of bad shit. And I'm like, you know, meanwhile, I've got a great supportive family and wife and my other my son's fucking awesome and you know all these good things but there's this so i had enough sanity to like keep my shit together but i was like this has to go somewhere you know so eric had moved back to town so i was like hey dude let's just start writing i don't give a shit what it is i don't care what we ever do with it or in we'll decide who's going to sing on it and what all that stuff later let's just start writing and that's what became sleepless so we started recording at Opal with my friend Kevin and it was interesting because the kind of the, the clincher was I, I, in my back of my head, I was like, God, if, if Kevin's saying, I'm, we're probably going to end up getting Brian Chaney. We'll get Brian Chaney because that's what we always do. And it'll be a thrashy thing, a little technical thrash, you know, I was, God, Kevin's saying, man, Kevin sings in Stone and Love, a fucking Journey tribute band, you know, and but he's a metal guy. You know, he could do this. And, and one day in the studio, I was like, oh, you need to hear Symphony X. And I put on something from Symphony X or whatever. And he said he heard, he says later, a year later, he's like, he heard that and heard their singer singing to heavier music and went, I could do that. And it just gave him a little bit of confidence. So when I asked him, Eric 
said, uh, let's get ask Kevin. So I'm like, dude, I'm with you. So Kevin, would you sing on this? Would you sing this? And he's like, I'll do it. I'm your guy. And I'm like, fuck, you're kidding me. So everything changed in my mind. Like, ah, you know, this is what I wanted. You know, like, you know, you hear the stories about Chuck, you know, with wanting to do that control denied thing, basically. Like when he said he loved our 89 demo, our 89 demo was when we started changing styles. We were still going do 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 like stuff he did on leprosy and stuff, but but we had but Mark St. Clear. And so I never knew that that's what he kind of you read the watch the documentaries about that that's what he secretly wanted to do, you know. And um so for me it was just it wasn't like picking a style or I want to do this or that. It was like I just wanted to express what I wanted to do. And to do to do that, I needed the right people. And it was me, Eric, and Kevin. And, and I got that. So once I got what I wanted, I was like fucking kid in the candy store. Now I'm just going to write. And, and I'm just, this was, was this around 2019, 2018, 2000, yep, 2000, 2019, I guess. Yeah. And um, yeah. So it was right. Pre pandemic. Right. Right. So, but so let me, let me, uh, it's, it's kind of off topic, but I got to ask this. You said that, that you were doing a, 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 a Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu. and I'm just yeah. curious what that teaches you that you apply to music in general. I mean, discipline, I guess, you know, I mean, but even then you can be disciplined at one thing and not at others. I mean, and, and, and really in, in jujitsu, like for me, cause I owned a can Academy was a job. So, you know, I had to be there every day and be on the mat and be physical. And, you know, as a black belt in jujitsu, it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of real martial art. So you have to wrestle people every day and you have to stay, you have to stay relevant. Um, or else you're like the old sensei in the office smoking cigarettes, like my karate teacher in sixth grade, you know, like you were signed a sign a black belt contract, you know, and you know, like that kind of shit. Right. So like, no, your black belt in jujitsu is just a big target. It says, try to choke me every day, you know? So I don't know if I learned anything from that. What I learned was that my business partner was a narcissist fucking psycho and I had to get out of there. And I went to therapy twice a week. And at the, you know, at the end of that, what I learned was life's too short to fuck around, do the stuff that makes you happy. And, you know, or figure out who you are. Uh, like RuPaul or something says something about that. But like, you know, like know who you are and be that 100 percent, you know, and that and that's it. So I just have to be honest to who I am. And part of that is dead conspiracy. It's tattooed across the top of my back with two fucking pentacles. I mean, you know, uh, and that's a big part of me, but it's not me. It's not all of me. It's definitely not my painting, you know, so I feel like. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. I feel like sleepless is. So I, I want to branch off of this painting uh, quote that you, you you keep mentioning, and I'm curious <laughs> what uh, what the with uh what it even means to to I guess you only have one painting. So does that mean that you're only known for one thing in your life and that's it? Or does, I don't know what that, the, the quote think, even means. I think that's what it meant. I think that's what it meant. It's like kind of like the Andy Warhol's 15 minutes of fame. You know, you're famous for 15 minutes and he used this quote from somebody else. I don't believe that is, is accurate. I think he probably struggled with anxiety of his own and thought, you know, well, people aren't liking what I'm doing right now. So I probably should have, I probably should have kept doing soup cans um you know but but for me it just it i tried to just sit back and go hmm what do i take from that and i and i think like the other day we were working i've tracked four songs on guitar by the way for the next sleepless album already um and so we were i was asking kevin hey let's do some co-writing on this song and he did this kind of randy rose like this boom boom like two notes and then he goes i got this and it feels right but now do that thing you do and I was like, what? And he's like, you know, do that. You know, this dissonant thing. I was like, oh, okay. I laughed. I was like, that thing I do, huh? And I thought, fuck, I went way back and, you know, like, what was the first thing I wrote? What was the second thing I wrote? And how similar do they seem to what I do now and compared to what other people do around me? And I was like, I guess I do have my own kind of signature, I guess, is what it, what it was to me. It's not that... It's not that I only have one painting. I've got billions, 
and I'm going to let myself have them, but I have a, a signature. Like, you know, there's not, I could never play like Alex Skolnick, you know, but I, but I like things that Testament did. And I just incorporate those into what I did And our, like our lead guitarist, Mark Remrev and Dead Conspiracy said to me one time, he's like, he'd come over to my apartment. He'd show me little riffs on guitar, simple little do, 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 do. And I, the next day I'd have a new song rip, rip, written around that idea, like the concept. And you go, how the fuck do you do that? Man, I've been playing that lick forever. And you wrote a whole song around it. Like this, cause that that's, what's in my head. And I can never play. I can't execute that really technical stuff. It's funny. I get called like technical thrash. I'm like fucking technical, dude. I, I, you know, I, I don't. Well, I mean the first song <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll get to, to host desecration, but the first track mm -hmm. of yeah. it, I hear some Mekong Delta influence in the first riff alone. So, yeah, I mean, not, I'm not many familiar people with even, their tunes, but oh, uh, well, again, see, there you go. There's my I know classic band. Yeah. yeah, yeah I know yeah. they're a classic band. And I'll, and I'll listen to it now. Like, uh, is it An Anacrusis? Anacrusis? Who's oh, that band? Anacrusis, great band, too. Yeah, exactly. Been, we were, I just saw a comparison. I think our label used a comparison to them. I was happy they used Nevermore in the description, but they, and, and Anacrusis, and I was like, Oh fuck! Here we go again. So I popped them on YouTube, and I went, "Oh, okay, I hear it." I was like, "Cool." I mean, I'm not like, gonna say we're not gonna sound like other people. I'm like, I'm just happy to find more cool bands. I mean, well, I, I didn't know these guys who they were. And I, I got to mention this too. I hear no Watchtower in your stuff. So <laughs> that was a, the I first time for, for fans of Watchtower. I'm like, oh, this doesn't sound like Watchtower, but I get the you know the it, they're trying to appease to a technical progressive style of music so somebody totally posts, but somebody put on on the album that's streaming through a new wave of traditional heavy metal full albums um on that youtube page someone made a comment and said something like sounds like technical thrash with blackie lawless on vocals and then something about like wasp mixed with watchtower and i was like fuck okay i mean cool i mean you know you, this this is the I think mean, maybe lyrics videos screw things up, but like, uh, I mean, seal or like lots of people have said, like, don't ever publish your lyrics, you know, cause people are going to create it into whatever they want to hear. You know, um, when I was a kid, my, my aunt and uncle had money and they had a brand new hot tub and Huey Lewis in the news had that song hot love and every night. And my uncle was saying hot tub and every night he thought that's what the lyrics were because they had a new hot tub. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, your, your brain, I'm like, fills in the blanks, you know, this stuff. So it's like, I don't know how to relate. So I'm going to call it something, you know, I, and I get kind of weirded out it's like going down the rat hole, but like I see them, I mean, you're reading all the social media shit and I'm looking at these things. And I like it though, that people are saying something like, wow, fantastic music, but not traditional metal. And I'm like, well, what the fuck is traditional metal? Well, I mean, I, sure. I, I it, get it. I, I get it. And I, and I get, I mean, for me, I'm like, like, well, like technical thrash i'm like it's voivod dude i mean i'm a piggy worshiper my 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 absolute and we missed that i guess my absolute obsessions musically is piggy and fucking mike from destruction and denner sherman those on a desert island i could have those and i'm good even without kiss you know, I mean, I just, if I have merciful fate, how many bowls of super sugar crisp I ate sitting there in front of my turntable with the Melissa album, you know what I mean? I mean, just, just changing my, my whole paradigm. Voivod, I bought the Roar album. I bought the same day as I bought Venom Black Metal. I put on Roar and I could not comprehend what I was hearing. I was like, what the fuck is this? Turned it off. I was like, it's cool, but I don't get it. I put it aside. I put on black metal. I'm like, yeah, now we're talking. And I went back and put that Roar album on a few months later. And that was, that was it. Like those jazzy chords, all this dissonant shit, but with this punky thrash, I'm like, ah, that's, that's, that's for me, you know, but, um, and those guys had that, you know, had a weird eclectic background too. And, you know, I think that's just for me, I just hear so much stuff. You, you'd be shocked. Like the amount of stuff I steal from seal is fucking amazing. I mean, lyric, like seriously, like if I sit in our, we have a, we built a sauna during the pandemic because we had nothing to do. And I'll, I'll, and I'm sitting in the sauna, I'll listen to Seal. I'm like, oh, fuck, what if I put these chords and I like use this, you know, kind of arrangement? I'm not talking about Kiss from a Rose or whatever. I'm like, the deep tracks, you know what I mean? It's just like, 
you just have to get experience uh, influence from everything for me. Like, you know, if I just listen to the metal bands, if I listen to Watchtower, we probably would sound like Watchtower. So I'm afraid that sometimes I listen to metal bands, you know, <laughs> I might start copying them. Now, how important was it for you to, to actually put out host desecration on a label such as, as metal warrior records and not do it, uh, the DIY approach and, and put it out independently. I just don't want to pay for vinyl anymore. I mean, and, and with that conspiracy, I paid for that vinyl and it's fucking sitting in the closet. Um, and new wave of traditional heavy metal, full albums, YouTube channel, um, ask claw hammer productions, our PR guys, um, if they could stream the EP and they did. And it was like a week later, I got a message from Mario from metal warrior saying, Hey, can we release this? And would you be willing to extend it to a full album? Um, so I went to the guys and I was like, Hey, these guys are saying they'll do vinyl, multiple colors. They'll do CDs, patches and or buttons and stickers and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, it's a small label, but they're passionate. They love metal and they want to do it. And I'm like, yeah, I could chop this to metal blade or see if I could get, you know, uh, hell's headbangers to listen to me. I, I, I don't know if, I think I I I just feel tainted with dead conspiracy for that with some of those labels or something. I don't know. I I have weird feelings about that. Sure. Um, but like I would love to I would love to work with Hell's Headbangers for sure. I'd love to work with bands labels like Metal Blade who still take unsolicited material. Um but they offered to do this um and they were passionate about it and I'm like fuck it, let's do it and and so we just set right to work we had to write five more songs it was like i just had to get get after it and do you still own your masters with this specific label yeah they have the right to um, produce it for five years okay okay so they, it's a uh, okay i got gotcha. you so you be, the rights revert back to you after a certain amount of time yeah gotcha. they have they have the rights to put it out for five years but um you know and they had agreed they didn't want me to release it in the u.s on ne ne on necromantic press which i still think would have been a good idea because of shipping that if i did all the band camp through necromantic press and i did like a thousand copies or something here 500 even that would have been helped a lot of fans to be able to get the record so at this point i'll get the one the copies they send me and i'll ship those out through band camp um but anyway, yeah, I mean, just not having to pay to put that out and having a little bit of distribution through uh, somebody else doing the work other than me, I, I'd really like to work on writing and not have to work on the business end that much. Well, or, there are other aspects to obviously making a record. And I want to touch upon this aspect and I'm going to bring it up here. You know, with the album cover in question, you know, what, mm -hmm. what is this, what is host desecration, I, the, the whole concept, what does it mean to you personally? Well, the whole album itself. No, just the the overall concept of the artwork and and how it translates. That's TJ Barber. Matt TJ is my guy, man. He did he did both those Dead Conspiracy album covers. Um, he did all the art for my Jiu Jitsu Academy. He's a, a professional graphic artist back east, and he's um he's a big metal guy, big metal freak, and um he gets me, you know uh he gets this kind of this, like this dark imagery. When you look through this picture, you know, he came up with the, the idea basically. I mean, we talked about the mood, like kind of this depression, anxiety. I mean, you got, you know, the rope around this neck back here and this woman's hair is going off and there's, there's so much the devil's unmasking, you know, this person with a fucking tree behind their head. I mean, whatever. I mean, it's like, there's just, when you look around, it's like, God, there's so many little subtleties. And I just wanted something that was, um, that was cool and kind of emotive in some, in some way to kind of show like, that's what sleepless is. It was like the first song I wrote was the man who could not sleep. Right. Which I took from a title from a 1950s pre-code horror comic. There's a story when the guy's like laid out with his eyes pried open and, you know, it's, and these people are carrying his body and I me mean, he's alive, but he can't, help, he can't sleep. You know, it's like the man who couldn't sleep. And I'm like, that's me. I mean, I stay, I'm, I'm up till three in the fucking morning every night because of anxiety and depression and just, you know, and so I, I wrote around that and uh, my first degree is in, in history. I went back to school for microbiology and virology, but um, now I deal comics full time. So, uh, but my first degree is in history and I've, I've always been super deeply fascinated with religious history um i fucking hate religion and um 
I, I try to find ways to jab at it in ways that are at least somewhat thoughtful. Like I love merciful fates approach, you know, but it's not my approach. Um, host desecration is if you're not familiar is just simply the act of, um, eating communal wafers without being a Christian. If you, it, tra- what do they call it? Tran- transmog, transmogrification. Uh, when, when you eat the wafers and drink the wine, they convert to the blood and flesh of Jesus. So if you're not a Christian and you do the such acts, then you're actually inflicting bodily damage upon the body of Christ, which is a punishable by death act. Um, there was one and I, can't remember where it happened in Europe, of course, but uh, there were 3,000 people executed for the act of host desecration at one time. Um, these kind of things don't get talked about in your Sunday school, you know. Uh, so not that anyone's ever going to pay attention or ever read the lyrics even, because I don't kid myself that they will, but necessarily, maybe one or two people will dig that. From it's just for myself. This it's my way of like, I'm gonna write a book, but in short form, you know, um, blood libel, you know, the the draining of blood from Christians to give Jews power and uh, you know rub on their on their wombs, uh, smear the blood from the what for what is it smear the blood from the uh, I can't remember now. You're, you're asking uh, the wrong guy, man. I, hey, no, so- no, I'm sorry, it's my lyrics. It was my lyrics. I should know my lyrics, but anyway. I mean, but the idea is that, you know, they're taking blood from Christian women, rubbing it on their, on their stomachs to give, have healthy birth. So, but all these things can be, are in old art. You know, there's, you, there's art where they show like, you know, Christian and the Jews are below them with the knives and they're jabbing them in the stomach to drain blood out of them. And, you know, these kind of things I think lent into like the, the vampire mythos, you know, so I called this song blood libel, a vampire story, va- vampire tale. So it's, kind of masked in this vampire story, but it's a, another song about Christianity. Um, so, yeah. So that's where that's really to me, like most of what the album is. Well, let's see. So this album cover to me personally is almost like German expressionism. It almost mm-hmm. reminds me of like, like Dr. Caligari or, or something like, like that, you know, in like, awesome. the, you know, the, what the, the silent era movie films and, and, you know, stuff that was like kind of very controversial, at a time when it was like film was brand making new. And so I don't know I just, this reminds me of like German expressionism. Just I love that you said that. In, in a, in <laughs> it kind of nails it. It yeah. kind of nails it. Yeah. You made it way more simple than my, my <laughs> description. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, I, I just, I, I really dig the album cover and, and dig the, the whole vibe of it, you know, vocals to me, I'm, I'm going to probably shoot myself in the foot for this, but so be it. You know, I had to really listen to the album a couple times to really appreciate the vocals yeah. <laughs> you know? because the riffs at first I was like, these are fucking slamming. I love the riffs. I love the production. And then the vocals kind of come in and it kind of, it's like I had to, I was a bit taken back by it, but I, the more I kept mm-hmm. listening, it's one of those albums that it's just, you have to just keep listening to get the vocals. I agree. It's, I not agree. Like, it's not just like a, uh, one of these albums where, you know, you can listen to it once and then get the whole picture. There's a yeah. lot of layers to it. So I do appreciate the vocalists approach in this one. Um, now I want to thank you so much again, Eric, for coming on the show and, and talking with me and hanging for, for a few. I really do appreciate a moment of your time yeah. to do this. And hopefully we can do this many other times after this, but where can people find host desecration and especially anything dead conspiracy related? Uh, Bandcamp. I mean, the Dead Conspiracy stuff's on Bandcamp. Um, yeah, and, and actually, you can hit me up through Instagram through the Sleepless underscore Metal. Sleepless underscore Metal, I believe, is what it is it. If you hit me up there, I can get Dead Conspiracy stuff out to people. I've got all the stuff on vinyl. I've got cassette re-releases. I've got CDs. Um, I actually have the CDs for Sleepless already in stock, and I have uh, shirts on the way. We have a cool tarot card design for uh, that has Baphomet uh, holding uh, Adam and Eve up by their necks. Um, we have another one that TJ, they did the album cover, did for uh, the song Mushroom Clouds at Night, which is a song I wrote about the idea that uh, there's a certain percentage of people that if a nuclear 
bomb blew up in New York with think it issued it was the sign of the second coming. And so we did TJ did a really great like wood block design based on that. It's fucking awesome. So shirts, all that kind of stuff. I mean, really just I am sent, you know, whatever DM slide into the DMs on uh sleepless underscore metal and just hit me up there with, you know, requests and I can get the shit out to people. Uh oh, yeah. deck conspiracy shirts I've got too. So it's absolutely well make sure to uh, to to support this is uh, to me one of the one of the best releases this year i really did enjoy it it's taken me a few times like i said to to do it so it, you guys might not get it right away with the sleepless you know the, with host desecration and whatnot but i really feel it, this is a, a record for definitely that people can can enjoy and i just appreciate a moment in time to help me promote this and help me promote what you guys are doing out there and uh you know, for thanks, just thanks again for giving me a moment of your time, man. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. This is fantastic, man. You have a great format, and uh, I'm stoked to be a part of it. I appreciate the the feedback and the, the you know the, I, I love to hear the people. If you're taking the time to listen, that's all that matters to me. If you got to listen to it a few times, I got no problem with that. I mean, most of the bands I think bring in a, a clean singer, and they end up just having to play like digga 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 digga, you know, so they can sing over the top of that. And we're like, fuck it, you got to sing over whatever I write. As crazy as it is, you know, I think it'll only just just get better. I'm co-writing with our singer now, so. Um, you know, I get my craziness and he gets to add his feel and it's going to be, the next one's going to be even better. Sure, man. Well, like I said, Eric, thanks so much again. And for another episode of Poppets Corner, guys, we're out of here. Cheers. Awesome.